Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome <clears throat> to today's webinar, Perform and Transform with Data and AI, Key Lessons from a European Blue Ship, uh, Rexel, the company uh, where we have the CEO today. Before I introduce uh, our participants today, my name is uh, Jörg Niesing. Uh, I'm a marketing professor uh, here at INSEAD. And uh, I'm <clears throat> usually I'm saying my research and my work is focusing on this triangle data analytics, digital transformation, and customer centricity. At INSEAD, I'm focusing mostly on executive education, and I'm also the program director of the open enrollment programs, B2B marketing strategies, and leading digital marketing strategy. Uh, last year, I published uh, my book, The Definitive Guide to B2B Digital Transformation, How to Drive Uncommon Growth by Prioritizing Customers Over Technology, which is, of course, uh, a topic we will address uh, today as well. Um, my co-author and I, we also launched uh, the platform B2BDigitalTransformation.com, where business leaders will find more content and research about uh, my topics. But uh, more important, let me introduce you uh, to you, the fantastic speakers uh, we have today. Let me start uh, with uh, Patrick Berra, who is the Chief Executive Officer at uh, Rexel uh, since uh, July 2016. And he, in, 20, uh, in 2003, he joined Rexel and has been appointed to CEO in 2016. Rexel is a French company specializing in the distribution of electrical heating, lighting, and plumbing equipment, but also in renewable energies and energy efficiency. Uh, the company was founded in 67. Um, yeah, today, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 26,000 uh, 26, employees and almost uh, 14 billion in revenues. Patrick started his career in 1978 with the Pulp and Paper Research Institute of Canada. And from 1988 to 1999, he occupied various duties with Polycom, including those of uh, CEO Europe and vice president of uh, the group. He served as an operations manager from Antalis from 1999 to 2002, prior to being appointed in 2002 as the chairman and CEO of Pinot Bois Materiaux, a company of the Caring Group. Welcome, Patrick. It's a real pleasure to have you today, knowing your busy uh, schedule as a CEO of a company of 26,000 employees. Welcome. Thank you. Then we have uh, Jean-Francois Lahaye. Uh, he's a senior partner and managing director of uh, BCG, and he joined BCG 2004. He is an INSEAD alum, startup investor, and is also responsible uh, for the relationship between INSEAD and BCG. So all my students here, this is a person you have to reach out to. Um, but uh, of course, uh, uh, Jeff uh, spent um, most of his time um, leading uh, large transformations uh, in the B2B industries um, in more than 20 countries uh, in industries from building materials, B2B distribution, automotive and engineering product. Over the last years, he has helped his clients build competitive advantage with digital, in particular by finding new avenues for growth through the creation of ventures or by taking advantage of data and artificial intelligence. So also here, uh, Jeff, welcome. Thanks a lot for being with us today. So let me uh, quickly uh, for the audience here, as you can see, today's webinar is part of our Tech Talk X series. And Tech Talk X are dedicated to exploring new digital technologies and their applications, as well as the impact these have on management, business, and society. It spans a wide spectrum of topics on both emerging and existing technologies and provide technology specific insights as well as management, business and societal perspectives. So if you want to find out more, please go to digital at INSEAD and later uh, I will also show you the upcoming webinars in our series. So yeah, let me maybe quickly start why we picked this topic, why we invited the key experts here. Um, when I was doing the research for my book, uh, we realized, yeah, that many companies um, go bankrupt still, although they are using uh, digital technologies and data. I mean, as you uh, see here on the next slide, I mean, the usual suspects everybody is uh, talking about from Blockbuster, Kuoni, Barnes & Noble. But again, the interesting thing is that many of these organizations um, actually 
said we need to leverage technologies, we need to digitize, but they still failed to transform. So what was the key reason? They didn't have a customer centric perspective. That's also uh, why I picked the subtitle uh, for my book, Prioritizing Customers Over Technology. And I mean, that's what we really learned in, in, in our research. So on the one hand, yes, technologies are important, but you need to understand what you want to do with it, right? Really understanding what do customers really need and what do customers really want. Having this customer-centric perspective as a value driver uh, in combination with uh, the technology you can leverage, this will yield uh, hopefully for your organizations uh, for future profitable growth. And what we realized, or my, me and my co-author in my research, when we interviewed over 3,000 uh, executives and we looked into uh, almost 50 uh, transformational studies, um, we realized there are actually three transformational shifts that companies are going through. And uh, here, uh, Sandra, if you could jump uh, to the sli next slide. Um, the, the first shift, um, one more, please. The first shift is uh, really, I call it the sell more, the digital selling shift. So you have a product, you don't change the product necessarily, but you look into how can I leverage digital technologies and data to sell more? Right? It's about engagement. It's about driving people down the funnel. The second shift, also most likely not new for many of you, is about, I call it the digital experience makeover. So less about engagement, but more about how can you create better outstanding customer experiences. But you are still focusing on the products or solutions that you are offering um, as an organization. And then the last one, uh, the most uh, tricky one, uh, the sell new, if you will, we call it the digital proposition pivot. So how do you pivot um, to a new uh, business model, right? And this is the most difficult one for, more, uh, for many organizations. We will learn about this today as well, uh, what we saw in our research, because it requires a mindset change in the organization, right? The first two, you're still focusing on what you have. I sell more or differently of what I have, but the last one is really about selling new. And why do companies fail? I call it the digital lipstick on a legacy pick, right? So uh, you are still like having the same business model and you're trying to digitizing it, uh, but it just doesn't work because you have to un change the underlying business model. And I mean, really here, last slide from my end um, to, to round it up, to make these three transformational shifts work, um, we are using this framework, we call it body, mind, soul, right? Of course, for me as a marketeer, I, I work a lot on marketing strategies, so the middle part, but we also saying, I mean, you have to have the right soul, the right values, right? Are you relevant as an organization? I mean, what are your symbols? What are your behaviors? You need the right body. I mean, this is, of course, also today's topic, um, data, uh, platform, software, you name it, the tools, the, the processes that are relevant here uh, to make this work, to be customer-centric, to transform the organization. And then, of course, you need the right mindset. Do you have the right people, the right talent? But even more important, uh, maybe also the top-down support from, from CEOs, from executives, really engaging, uh, creating a culture um, to drive uh, a transformation uh, forward. Um, so this is really uh, to, to open it up a little bit to uh, give you an overview of what to expect today. Uh, but I thought it's always good to start with a, with a little poll uh, to include you here, the audience. And uh, I just wanted to ask you a simple question here. I'm doing your ongoing research so what you say now will be uh, maybe published in my next book. Um, so simple question, what are the three top challenges um, that your organization is facing? So you can select up to three when it comes to uh, digital transformation within your organization. 
So let's give it uh, 30 seconds here while people are answering. Uh, I don't know what to expect and neither do Jeff and Patrick, but let's use this as a starting point for our discussion. Okay, why don't we take a look into the results? Here it is, the winning, or the, not winning, the most important barrier, building the right transformation culture, lack of expertise to lead digital transformation, 40%, then closely followed by legacy business model, back to the uh, lipstick on a legacy pig. Uh, maybe I biased you here a little bit. And then also already followed by insufficient data and analytic capabilities. So maybe some people are biased by the title we picked. But yeah, I mean, maybe uh, Jeff, Patrick, I mean, you are two experts in this field. Uh, Patrick, you are uh, the CEO of an organization, an incumbent um, that is undergoing a, a heavy transformation. I mean, what, what do you think about these results? Any, anything um, yeah, similar to what you experienced at Rexel? What's, what's your key takeaway? Let me start with you, Patrick. For me, uh, yeah. For me there, there is one surprise, the lack of data. There are many more data than normally we think. And they are not of the same nature, but there is plenty of data that can be used, internal, external, whatever it is. Therefore, from my view, I, I went through this and I was saying at the beginning, I don't have enough data. I had more, more than needed. Um, which data to be used for what? Therefore, um, the other thing which surprised me, the legacy of existing culture. Um, we underestimate how much it takes to change the legacy, because uh, there is no good digital with, with the same legacy. You have to change, you have ready to go for a change. Um, and and uh, if not, yeah. um, your curve of the beginning of so many companies who just disappear, probably they were the hostage of their legacy yeah. and uh, of the past. And so it's very result. difficult because yeah, because you need to provide the numbers every day and shareholders and everybody try to get you do better of the same. And here you have to change and you have to put some of these business models, business, uh, the way it is structured, the way you do things at risk. And you have to trust the data and don't trust only the people who tell you, no, no, I know. And uh, therefore, data uh, to me, everybody has a lot of data but they ignore which one to use for what. Yeah. Um, be ready to change immediately the legacy. Otherwise you are the hostage, you develop, you spend money. At the end, you have nothing more than statistical so statistics running a past business model. So the results um, we see here is somewhat linked to what you experienced at Rexel, right? Talking about- Oh yeah, there is no, no difference, yeah. yeah. And maybe here, maybe Jeff, uh, your perspective, I know you guys published a study uh, recently where you even went a step further and you said 70% of all transformation actually fail. They don't reach uh, the uh, expected ROI. Uh, I mean, is this linked to the results we're seeing here? Yeah, so indeed, so we published uh, end of last year um, a survey based on roughly 900 data points, both internal uh, from our clients and external. And what we look at is a definition, do digital transformation reach the expected value impact, but also sustainable change. I and mean, then we see indeed that only 30% reach both, 40% see some value below expectation, but no real sustainable change and, and 30% have none of, none of the two. Um, so when, when uh, and, and we identified six key success factors, but when looking at the first at the list, um, what surprised me first, uh, we see a lot of questions related to the how, and I, I think that indeed the how is extremely important. At the end, the what and the how are multiplicative. They're not additive. People think that they will do the what, and after they will do the how, 
the how is zero, you will have zero. So the um, the only, I, I think um, what's, I'm not surprised by the outcome. I indeed, uh, and, and building on the comments made by Patrick, I still think that if you don't have any vision or strategy, you will struggle and don't, don't go into transformation. For the rest, I think most of the points that we are made here, even the transformation culture can be overcome. Yeah. Goes along yeah. the way, we can talk about that later, but um, you may think you don't have the right culture, but you should, it's worth trying and go into it because you know, you will, you will, it will be a journey uh, with a lot of failure, a lot of learnings, and you will learn along the way. So I don't think you can say my culture is not the right one. So it's doomed to fail. I, I don't think so. But it's great to be aware that you have a culture will be, will be a, a, an issue to overcome. Yeah. I mean, before we dive into this topic of culture later, uh, what I find interesting when I'm listening, when I'm listening to you is you talk more about data and less about digital. Yeah. I know digital is the most overused buzzword and I'm digital yeah. transformation. I'm also not a fan of it, but I mean, maybe you guys can elaborate, maybe Patrick a little bit I, on this. Uh, let me start with you again. Here. What, why do you call it a data transformation and not a digital transformation? Um, in a moment you accept to use the data, you have to work on the quality of data, but then you have to trust the data and trusting the data is a culture by which before going into digital intelligence, making sure the data are clean, that you, you have them all as much as you can. And then you define what is your pain points by which some data will bring clarity uh, because uh, um, there is so much belief, there is so much practice, you know, I will never forget that 30 years, people coming to me after 30 years and telling me, but I know, uh, everybody knows in a company, the best employee or they all know, they know something and data is always telling us that they know only a piece or they think they know and they don't know what's happening today. They always know what was happening yesterday and uh, in the last five years. Um, my, my best employee who could tell me a lot, uh, they were partially wrong. And uh, it's difficult to get an organization of with thousands of people to trust, to make, to make them trust data. Therefore, make them work on cleaning up the data, make them work on making the right definition, which data represents what, because we were building the buy-in. And then once we have the data, we choose uh, how to exploit, how to, what to make out of it. But data first, absolutely. It's product content, it's customer description, it's uh, supply chain parameters, whatever it is, it's not finance. Finance is easy. They all work in companies. The rest is unstable, is not of the same quality. Yeah. So data matters. Oh, yeah, yeah. data is key. Yeah. Digital yeah. come after. Digital is a way Just to use the data. No, ju just I, I think. Uh, thanks, Sir, for yes. asking this question. I, I think it's a it's a very uh, it's a very important question. I think until a few years ago, digital transformation meant digitizing processes. So it was basically doing better of the same. It was about covering processes end to end, lowering the cost of transaction, automating tasks, creating economies of scale through you know shared service centers, that kind of thing. That is great, but that that made companies more efficient that didn't make them smarter. I think what people have come up and have realized over the last years is that data can talk uh, behind every transaction, behind every interaction with a customer. I'm learning something from her. I'm learning that she's connecting three times with me instead of just once a month, that she's buying me some products that she never bought, or that Usually, I have this big seasonal uh, order that I'm not getting that time. So maybe that could be something that means that she's going to churn. So I think that, and, and the approach is totally different. It's not about end-to-end -end coverage of processes. It's about finding the right pockets of value that makes a difference. If you, are a telecom, if you are a telco company, churn is a massive thing because your, your clientele tends to be sticky. You know, uh, If you run a business with very high fixed cost, capacity constraint, 
demand forecast is super important because you know where to allocate the right products. Predictive maintenance is very important because you don't want your plan to go uh, to be to be uh, not working. So businesses by business, people have to identify the very few use cases, the very few points in the value chain where data matters instead of having this kind of one size fits all, very process driven approach where you implement large IT system across the board in a not very differentiated way. Here it's about what are the three, four use cases that will make me stronger than my competition. And I think Patrick has a very good examples to give on, on, on this one, but it's a very different approach. And I don't know if we can see the, 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 the slide on the dam, I think it's, uh, I like it because um, what it basically shows, uh, um, I don't know if we can see it. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, to, to, to me, the, the point on that is, as, as Patrick said, uh, there is no excuse for not generating data or collecting data. Even if you run a very analog process, sensors have been, price have been divided by five in just a, a few years. So even if you have a very old kiln from 60, 1960, you can measure everything with sensors. So you have this apparently inert mass of data and it can produce massive energy. It's a question of depth, it's a question of flow, but uh, you have a treasure if you, if you are able to generate data. I mean, that's maybe a perfect uh, point here uh, for the next question for, for Patrick. Uh, because you both talked about use cases and Patrick, you also said earlier, massive amount of data. I see this in my, my programs, right? We discuss it, executives have lots of data, but the key problem for them often is where to start, right? Where should I start? I mean, how did you do this at Rexel, such a big organization, right? How did you prioritize all these use cases? Uh, to find uh, the ones that really have a, a quick, uh, big impact, if you will. Well, um, when, I, when I became a CEO, um, I was facing 10, 20 years of acquisitions and we didn't know how to grow organically. And in terms of return, it's not the same because then the cash you have to put to acquire businesses, not always well integrated at the end, was not great. Therefore, and I'm, it's amazing because in your book, you say sell more. And I was just thinking the way for me it was, it was more customer, more SKU. It's more customers, second column, more SKU, first column, product client, before anything else. And in order to do that, uh, obviously more product, demand forecasting for, for plan and national level, okay? Um, ideal branch assortment in the moment, this is where most of my traffic was still there, even you know, the one and two. It became the way by which with data, I was trying to get fixed what is the more customer and the more SKU. Now, I was also, finding out that we were working 200 man days per year for the sales force at replacing lost customers. And if you want to do more customer, more SKU, we need free, free time for. Therefore, we looked at what he is called on the churn and targeted retention, but also for more, for more customer, it's one thing, the more SKU is upsell and cross sell. And here in this first one, two and four and five, were the first one we decided to start with because they were the way. And by the way, over three years of doing this right, using more data and fact-based and all the tools that you can get once you have the data, we grew by a billion, one billion out of a company making at that time 13. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite significant by focusing heavily on this. For a, cost, for a company who never did that ever, ever before, because we were just buying uh, other distributors. And by the way, um, through the COVID, all of this got totally disorganized, but we retrained the algos and at the exit, these four, one, two, four and five here, 
these four blocks remain key and fundamental at any moment of the restart. And therefore, we were so fast getting out of the COVID phase. And we are still adjusting permanently this. And uh, then comes, obviously, the margin and the value for, which is price and margin, which is sell differently. Um, what do we charge a premium for? What do we don't charge a premium for? Uh, how to be competitive to the best, personalized pricing, and uh, which is your sell differently. And, um, and also the number nine here, product margin optimization through substitution, especially now. Uh, when we did it, I was not totally sure how much it would bring. Today, we have a lot of disruptions, um, a lot of supply chain issues, a lot of component missing, and probably for the next year or two, it will be like this around the world. And which substitution we can get organized in order to have a margin optimization. And in our case here today, it's even more than the margin optimization. It's serve the customer, it's customer service optimization. Therefore, what you see here, um, our real life by more customer, more SKU and better, which is sell more, sell differently and to some extent sell new. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting to hear, Patrick. So back to Jeff's earlier point about uh, digital was about uh, optimizing processes. I mean, also I could say, say with data, data could be used for cost saving activities and revenue uh, generating activities. But I think Jeff, you said it earlier, value creation is about uh, creating a competitive advantage. So how important is this customer centric perspective for you when it comes to, to uh, the data driven transformation? Jeff, no. Uh, no, no, I think first- Question for whom? No. Or the two oh. of you. <laughs> No, I, just just a few words on that. I think everything starts from the client, you know. Um, and if you are a startup uh, and you go to to VCs and you ask for, for for equity, the first question they will ask you, you know, it's famous magic question: What is your customer acquisition cost? What is your customer life value? So it's all about this at the end. Huh? When you when you look at uh, when you have a perspective of growing, when you have a perspective of of organic growth and, and developing business. So of course, so what what we see huh, at clients is that. The, people, the, the companies that are customer-centric, they leverage a lot of data because they want to come from a segmentation that is you know, more and more uh, you know, detailed into something that goes into behavioral segmentation. So you can integrate the notion of what does my client behave like? How can I better respond with next best action, next best offer kind of reaction? So that, that's the starting point of everything. And this is what makes you... Um, better than, than, than your competitors. So it's, it's a basis of competitive advantage. And just give an example that everybody knows. When Amazon started, uh, was, was launched, the objective of Jeff Bezos was to, to offer the best customer experience and, and to collect data. And who would have imagined that now monetization of the customer data represented $20 billion business? Um, you know, customer customer centricity and data as a, as a basis of competitive advantage. Yeah, and maybe here also looking at, uh, with one eye to the chat here, uh, first comments come in about, of course, uh, automation of AI, right? So maybe maybe link to this question. I mean, how did this uh, change, for example, at Rexel again, Patrick? Uh, yeah, an incumbent uh, uh, over 50 years old. Uh, I mean, how important is artificial intelligence uh, for you as a technology uh, today uh, compared to uh, five years ago? And I mean, knowing you are uh, an incumbent uh, B2B organization, um, maybe also, uh, yeah, how quickly were you able also to change how it's used uh, within Rexel? One thing of the B2B that uh, in a single country, we trade 300,000 different SKU per year, uh, which is an average per major country. And every night we, we ship in the main country 100 to 120,000 order line, meaning we have a huge data source. We have, and we didn't know how to characterize the segmentation and we first treated from the data to find out 27 different customer groups by behavior and no longer 
the customer group by nature of a product they were taking. It was product driven. And here it was at a sudden customer groups driven. And that will be key segmentation because then it goes for pricing. It goes for many other AI application without a proper customer segmentation. And then the first application we were looking for is 200, 200 man days lost just to replace customer was how can I find out who is likely to churn? Even if I don't know yet, or do we know when they will churn, they are likely to churn. And the first AI, what could we get out of these huge behavior of placing orders every day, every week, which kind of a product as of when, the typical profile of the one who are uh, starting to erode or purchasing with us and going to a competitor and kind of stuff that nobody sees and uh, nobody sees. And therefore we decided find out through the algos, uh, a series of algos, how to come to a churn list, meaning every sales rep receive now every fortnight, a list of the first five to 10 customer likely to churn. And then we figured out by using that if you react within three weeks, either by phone calls or by visit or by whatever something, getting connection to it, you reduce by half the, the risk of a definitive churn. And then more by the nature of the quality of how do you interface, you can even reduce by another 25%. And at least it's useful time instead of uh, non-productive time and, and straight to the issues and, and not go to the friends or to the one which are the easiest by go to the pain point by which your customer are suffering and therefore they may go. And the churn was a real cult cultural shift, which was the first algo we used. We used another one on pricing, but it was only uh, more specific to a country. But the first one was these churn customers because you you touch in a distribution company, every sales rep, you know? When I say a sales rep telling me, but like, I know this customer for 20 years. He's not going to leave me I mean, because I know him and he would tell me if something goes wrong. And six weeks after, first signal, six months after, customer is gone. And then, by the way, when you play back two years back and, and people get surprised because the one they lost, they could, we could predict they were on the way out. And this is what the churn has been about in terms of uh, also creating the trust into an algo, the trust into the data, because it's something that nobody saw coming and that everybody finally got a real case uh, he was confronted with. Yeah. Therefore, algos, algos, not every algo is useful. Not every algo will be visible to everyone. If I would have to recommend one thing, pick up a few algos that change the life of the key people then they trust, and then you can do on procurement and other things. Yeah, starting with, with low hanging uh, fruits and use cases here, yeah, it's a, it's a great example. I mean, J Jeff, from your perspective, is there any ideal approach uh, what organizations could do, a process to follow when leveraging AI? You no, know, I think first, uh, as uh, I think the first step would be to select the use cases. I think they, they tend to be known now by industry. Uh, I mentioned a few in other industry, but I would say that you don't start with a blank piece of paper and just try to analyze the full value chain and find it. I think it's uh, it has become easy to select them, but it's not because you select them that they will, they will, um, they will deliver anything. So you need first to give the ownership of this use case to business people. Uh, uh, it's great, you need to have a, a great CDO, great CIO, but when you run the use case, you need to give them to the people who have the PNL, and they need to run them. And, and then you, you, because I think the biggest trap I've seen in, uh, in data transformation is what we call the POC factory, the proof of concept factory or a lab. You, you have very smart data scientists that create algos, and they say, yeah, of course, Sean, I have it. Mr. Berra, pricing, I have it as well. But you know, where is it? <laughs> do people use it? So it's really there that the, the, the question is, how do you, who do you give the use case to? And once you have piloted them in a good way so that they, they, you know, they are in the hands of the people with a management routine. And I think the example that Patrick was giving is very interesting. 
interesting because you could think that churn is an easy one. Only affect sales rep. I mean, if I'm a sales rep and you convinced me that my clients will churn, I should react. In spite of that, it takes leadership, it takes change management to, to make it successful. So you really need to make sure that all the dimension will be taken into account. And finally, I think you need to think um, of, this, uh, of these use cases as products, not as projects. So when you will roll them out, the pricing you will roll out in France will be different from the one in Germany, from the one in, uh, in the US. And you need to make sure that these products evolve uh, and it's not what size fits all, but you learn you have version one, version two, et cetera. And you need to make sure that you, you have the right mechanism uh, to make them evolve. And this is where the CDO and the CIO play a role. And, um, and, and, and then they will become competitive advantage uh, and not just I implemented this ERP and this is done because this is an always on transformation, the data one. Uh, products will con constantly evolve like the apps you have on uh, your, your iPhone or your, your Android uh, evolve all the time. Yeah, but you guys bring up a good point that brings us uh, yeah, to the one block I wanted to definitely dive also deeper into here in the last eight minutes before we open it up about the enablers, the culture. But maybe just one question linked to, linked to this uh, from the audience here. I see the question from Pascal Creteau, uh, which is an interesting one. Uh, Patrick, you talked about trust earlier, right? You have to win trust. Uh, Pascal is asking, I mean, how do you overcome the hyper focus on budget and quarterly results when you want to embark the company into a digital transformation? I think that's a very interesting one, as if I'm not mistaken, since you are in this transformation, stock price went up from 13 to 17, I can't remember. So there's a positive correlation at Rexel, but I can, I can see shareholders are driving you short-term results and you have the long-term picture. So how do you balance? Um, I have to give the, you have to be clear. I mean, um, all the first two years of development, it brings nothing. And I had to take part of the delta revenue of the company to finance it instead of putting it to the bottom line. Some went to the bottom line, some went to what I call investment in the future. And you have to explain on the why and the how. And shareholders understand one thing, there might be a higher multiple at the end. Therefore, it's a, mat it's a matter of trajectory. But it is true that you operate under heavy constraints of either I cash, I, I do some development, the churn, I cash in. But if I don't finance pricing, and if I don't finance already the next one, and these next ones cost, uh, but you have to be very selective on other things. I can tell you very, very transparently. I was the worst man during three years in seeing no, 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 no to anything else. I could have done many other things. No, you have to be, you have to be sure what you do. You have to go to it. You have to take as much, very few, in depth, owned by everybody, and. I give you another algo. It's when we did the branch assortment. Every branch manager in my business, I have 450 in France, 2000 around the world. They think they have the best assortment for the kind of proximity customer that they do have. But each of them through the algo, they have to modify 20 to 25% of the assortment. And it was also with the logistic, they have to return and get other stuff. But they win. 2% growth in a non-growing market at that time. And 2% growth, it was making the difference in their own budget and their own money in their pocket. Because all the fixed costs were constant, these 2% at the right price were just making a difference when they implemented it. But it is true that there is, again, don't do something else. You have to do three or four of these algo application, make it happen, make it happen, by the way, until the COVID, the last year, we said, make it happen. It was the, the theme of the year. Because to develop more, maybe in parallel, but in terms of use case, make it happen. And it takes every business review, every moment you talk with them. My first question was, where are you? Um, the CEO, I mean, um, Jeff Perby, you have other experience, but I don't know how many man days I have spent in it personally, how many, how many intensity you have to put. 
just to take all my managers with me. By the way, you know, my finance director, he was absolutely, he said, Patrick, Patrick, uh, you cannot go forever like this. I say, hey, cool down. One day I will find an algo to the budget for you. Uh, now, joke aside, um, it, it is a matter of willingness, showing, timing, get things done. Don't let people wait. Otherwise they go backwards. Never let them go backwards. Mm. And it um, yes, it is true. There is pressure. Yeah, but it's also, I have to explain. I think uh, I, 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 in full fairness. Me... No, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say, it sounds like, Patrick, you heavily got involved as the CEO uh, itself, right? So, Jeff, I mean, what, what's your perspective in, in general? No, I mean, ju formula? no, I mean, ju just maybe also on the points we, we, we saw through the poll, and uh, I, I really think that you need to embed your, your digital transformation into your equity story. We see, so many, we see a lot of CEOs that tell a story to the analyst. That is like, I'm going to extend my product range. I'm going to go into geography. I'm going to position this market. I'm going to review my footprint. And then people say, what about digital transformation? Oh, it's a key enabler. I think in the case of Rexel and, and, and the 30% companies that regenerate value, number one, the digital transformation is the equity story. It's part of it. It's just not an enabler of it. And I think uh, in, in the distribution space, it's it's a game changer. You know, it's uh, It's about generating 1.5 points of margin in businesses that generate 5% of margin. So it's massive. And second, I think that the involvement of the CEO here too is, uh, is what, what makes the difference because uh, the, the project you're describing, uh, Patrick, I think it's, uh, it's, it's your project. You know, it's, uh, it's not just, uh, you are not, it's not just some country manager and the CEO that run it, it's you. It's your, it's your initiative, it's your, it, the way you, you, you saw this business transformation. So it has to come from the CEO to the middle management all across the group. Yeah. And you both, I mean, you both talked about algorithms. So let's maybe dive into the, the questions here because they are nicely linked to the discussion we have. Um, if, if, I, if I look at the, the question here, two people actually, uh, Carl, you, you're also asking, in what cases do you think it is important to uh, data analysis uh, internally versus outsourcing, right? So same question from Bruno. I mean, should, you, should it be owned uh, or developed internally? On the one hand, it sounds like you are, uh, as a CEO, heavily involved, uh, Patrick, but of course, you cannot do anything. So, so how did you do this? Did you do most of it internally or did you outsource it? Uh, the, in, the internal dimension is the strategic vision that the CEO should have and with the COMEX. And the one thing internal that you should keep an eye on to be sure that the development that you can get made outside is not taking you to another journey than the one you choose for. And But um, get the help of the external, definitely. You can never get the critical mass on day one. You, can, you cannot do it with two data scientists you have structured data engineers. And by the time, in order to attract people, you need an external help. You need, I mean, you, and by the way, it's not the most costly thing because if you have to build everything, it takes years and you never get there. You get the critical mass immediately and also a double vision, what, how to prioritize on what at some moment. And there are certain discussions. But I will give you an example, very simple and short. Um, not too long ago, I, uh, I was in a discussion with the digital engineer and, and data scientist of the company, and they were telling me um, uh, how to optimize, it was something with the inventories and the supply chain under budget constraints. I say, what? What are you doing here? Uh, uh, an inventory, it's not a budget matter. It's a must between supply and demand as a distributor. Therefore, you will get optimized under optimization of customer satisfaction and how to define a customer satisfaction. Okay, you may have different data stream to structure in a certain way, but it is the only way. And, and you know, the CEO has to be there for this kind of issue. And um, therefore I, I really, uh, I would like to, to insist on management, it's his journey not technically, but in terms of making sure it goes at the right place. 
Uh, if I would let this go, now other people can do it, but top level people should really, otherwise you never make a different company, by the way. You make a company of yesterday with uh, digital information. Uh, it has to be a company of tomorrow. Can you, the redesign of the inventories of a distributor for customer satisfaction after years of private equity and everything else where it was really to, to minimize the amount of money spent on inventory, if you can imagine what it is. It's a shift in culture, like 180 degrees. Yeah. But we did it. And no. by the way, the stock price. Yeah. And you know, this, this is, sorry to take a little bit of time, but this is a real, real thing that the CEO should take, drive the people, the frequency. You know, there's not a single month where I don't review all of them. And if they need me three times in the meantime, I make my agenda free to have this free time. And, and uh, because show, show how much you are, you are uh, motivated, but also the amount of money spent, we need to get a payback for. And the payback could be cash inventory, could be PNL. You know, the story of Rexel is a story of return on, on uh, investment, return on capital employed. Um, and it's also, uh, go back to something in the future that we self, self improving. And the more you use the algo, the more you improve. And then you get a different multiple on the stock exchange because people rate you for a company mm. uh, which would start to be digital. Yeah. So it sounds like, although we talk about AI and algorithms and technology and you talk about it, is it more a people transformation? I mean, Jeff, Jeff what, what's what's your perspective? No, maybe we can we can show uh, we can show a slide. You know, we we, we have a, we have an entity called BCG Gamma where we, we do a lot of AI. But I think the starting point on, on our conviction was, was I don't know if we can show this slide was that at the end of the day when you talk about data transformation, it's uh, algorithm is only ten percent of the effort. It's ten percent algorithm. It's twenty percent technology IT. You know, data lakes, data platform. Uh, cloud and so on but at the end of the day it's 70 percent business and people transformation and i think it's and this is what what patrick described earlier it's not because you have a right algorithm that it will fall into people routines and people will know exactly uh, kpis will be aligned and 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 it will all, all of this will be consistent and people will adopt it and also one point i would like to make is that we are very convinced that you know, if I just take um, some illustration in a, in, a, in a fast fashion retail uh, where we, uh, we, we, we did a massive data transformation, we saw that humans could predict, uh, you know, forecast with like 45%, sometimes 45% accuracy. AI can do 70%, but if you combine human and AI, you reach 80%. So it's not because you have the belt algorithm that you have. You are at the, at the asymptote. You can, you, you know, human sales reps know things that the machine will never know. They know that some competitor will launch a campaign that things that are not internally available will happen or some trends happen also. So this combination, putting the human at the center of the organization is extremely important because of this equation, but also because in a machine learning context, everything that can be fed also by in mind and all the richness of human know-how can, uh, can boost the machine learning uh, algorithm. Yeah. No, I mean, this is great. It's linked to the, the body, mind, soul we discussed earlier. Maybe here a question from Louise. I mean, now we talked, about, um, we talked about people, but Louise has this question I get in the classroom a lot. Uh, he's asking a lot of infrastructure and data structuring need to be put in place before even thinking about a data-driven decision. So uh, that's what I'm hearing as well. We have to spend lots of money on, on all the systems, right? I mean, how did, how did you do this, uh, Patrick? How did you approach this? How did you get buy-in, right? Because um, I'm sure you invested some money here in the systems. Yeah, we invested money, we invested time. As I said, we also prioritized and we didn't invest in other uh, parts of the business, of the old business model that we could have done. I mean, there was no issue. I could have done more in uh, logistic centers and kind of stack. And uh, we asked them to become more effective without major investment in order to free up the money uh, to do this. But let's put it this way. You need to get a good platform, well-structured, very clean. And for that, you need help from outside. Um, you need to have uh, uh, AI 
a specialist that you don't have the day one. And first you subcontract before you get your own team. And then you need to have a, a partner outside plus your own cost and people to these people, you know, you need to motivate them to keep them and uh, feed them. And it's a never ending journey. At the end of the day, you replace conventional cost by uh, AI and so on cost. Yes, it is. It is it cost something uh, to be frank. Uh, an AI development, once you have the platform and everything else is between if you subcontract uh, uh, help from outside, uh, it's something between one and three million uh, each, uh, assuming you have the data structure already in place. Uh, you have a platform which is scalable, but it, which has to be maintained, upgraded. It's uh, permanent. You double your uh, protection for cyber because in the moment you have this, you cannot be, uh, I can tell you, I went from uh, two to 10 million on, on uh, investment per year on spending to prevent cyber risks and never bulletproof, never ever. But in doing so, you also work on your conventional IT so that the data stream that comes is could be at any time disconnected from and kind of stuff. Um, and the more you progress, you face new issues. Yeah, it's cost, I agree. Um, but if I would have to do it again, uh, I would accelerate. Yeah. I would Very accelerate good. because once you have the critical mass, um, it, it's not a major cost. Yeah. It is the way to run your business and you invest into your business. Yeah, very good. Having, uh, but also here linking it back to your earlier point uh, to to business problems, right? That's that's the, the key part. I mean, maybe linked to this, uh, we had it also earlier in in the body, mind, soul, uh, the data governance, right? So Gauthier uh, is asking that question about what did you put in place to manage the data governance? Well, I have a team for that. Uh, data governance, the way they are structured, the way we correct. We have, and the team is not data specialist. It's not the data. It's called, I would call data engineers, uh, how to segment the customer base. If there is a new customer, do we segment it in the right place for the rest? Because then this would be the wrong pricing, everything. Went, and you have to renew and revisit year each year. And by the way, for example, on customer segmentation, the entire sales force, once a year, revisit the entire customer portfolio and reallocation helped by an IT application soft that tells them yes or no, or it should be in category A or B or C or D, and then reallocate them so that it falls into the right category. And then, and then all the, the algos are really up to date. Now for this, we use the CRM and we re-inject into CRM. Don't make it a standalone thing. The one, one thing I learned also, whether we have the best or not best CRM, we were feeding through the CRM, but we were using also, for example, for the churn, the way to give a feedback by the market, if the customer, what they did at visiting or not at calling the customer, went through the CRM. You can also modify your other tools, more passive tools, descriptive tools, to make them an active role as part of a global way by which we feed the algos through the CRM in order to keep maintained and running. And this kind of, this kind of uh, that uh, um, governance need to be clear. There is no other way to maintain the, the churn algo. There is, you, know, you have to redefine all the rules. Otherwise it clicks everywhere. It's partial only and, and it's never good enough. Yeah. Maybe a quick follow-up uh, question here for you, uh, Patrick, uh, from uh, Ali Reza, because you just mentioned churn, which is a, of course, an important question for for, for, for almost every organization. I mean, what are the key factors, not to say signals you looked uh, into to predict churn? I know that there are roughly uh, 21, 22 key data flows and the churn is, the, the identification of churn is not the same if it's an industrial customer or a small installers in my case. Therefore, at the end of the day, there is a parameterization of the sensitivity of certain uh, detection signals uh, that that's more for a customer A, B, C, or D. And, and um, but you learn by working. It's not something you do well the first time. And therefore, uh, there has been three or four back and forth at, at the churn. 
there was even a moment where we found that the churn was a way by which we were putting a lot of pressure on the sales organization to try to compensate for. Hey, if you rush, you forget the rest. Therefore, we had even to say, it's not a matter of urgency. Churn is not just urgency. It's a fundamental reason by which people have a good reason or bad reason to churn. You can work on the urgency and they are the more fundamental things. Therefore, you need to cross the churn with the net promoter score. Uh, which is by itself already a set of different, uh, uh, you know, and, and this, that's where we are today. But churn is, is something that will evolve. I, if, if I would be back in two years time, I would probably tell you in the meantime, there will be one, two upgrades, maybe three of the churn, because the more you progress, <laughs> the more you want the granularity to be right, because at the end of the day, you end up with individuals, customers so centric that the granularity would do apply, which should be applied to this one or the other one, belongs to a set of people for which the recipe did work. And then you have to find if the same recipe would work with the next one, with the new one to churn. And therefore, it's a dynamic mode. Um, there is a risk there. Where do you stop in terms of granularity? At the beginning, we said it's customer centric. Oh, yes, data brings you to have almost the ability to run your business even big and major by giving the right, the right elements for everybody to behave in the best way vis-a-vis -vis the customer centricity. This is the beauty of it if people know how to use it. Now, I'm a little bit modest. I am only in the middle of a journey for that. Yeah, yeah very good. Thanks for, for sharing. Maybe last quick question here, uh, Jeff. That, that must be a question uh, from... Uh, from a student uh, about prediction, not just for, for churn, but uh, predictive recruiting. Uh, is BCG applying this kind of technology uh, for recruitment? <laughs> it must be, must be an MBA student <laughs> from Angelica. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But again, as a, the, there are a lot of applications of, uh, of uh, AI for HR. And, and all, all, by the way, also identifying the people who will churn in terms of leaving the company. But yes, we do, but that does not replace uh, the human touch point that we have and the interview we have. Uh, we are not planning to replace, uh, you know, interviewers by robots. Uh, so we are more in a, in, a, in a world where data and human in a touch uh, add together and make, uh, and make recruitment uh, even richer and more efficient, but... Uh, yeah. No, I mean, looking at the, the almost at the top of the hour, I mean, there are great, uh, great questions still here. So first of all, thanks to, uh, to you too uh, for, uh, I think, what is a fantastic webinar with lots of uh, takeaways uh, for the audience. Uh, hopefully, thanks to the audience for fantastic uh, questions. Uh, we covered, uh, we covered uh, yeah, a few of them. We're not able uh, to cover all. Um, so let's see. Maybe we have some time to follow up uh, on a few of these uh, going forward. But yeah, big, big thank you. Uh, and um, so now uh, really literally to, to inform you about the, the upcoming uh, webinars. Um, so I don't know, uh, um, Sandra, if you wanna show it, we have some uh, webinars coming up uh, literally um, next, uh, in two days from now, which is the rise and limits of AI in recruiting. So very much uh, linked uh, <laughs> To the last uh, question yes. done by my colleague uh, Stuart Black. Yeah, and uh, feel free to be uh, to stay in contact. Um, feel free to to visit uh, the uh, my my platform. Um, yeah, B two B Digital Transformation .com, where we also um, yeah uh, upload uh, recordings of webinars as we do on the INSEAD website as other articles. But uh, thank you all. Thanks to the audience. Thanks Jeff and Patrick. Uh, for making it a great uh, webinar and thanks to the INSEAD team, uh, to the many people involved here uh, for setting this up. Stay tuned and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.